Hello, everybody. And we've got two online panelists to join me and Judy. We've got Stephen and Miguel. And today, we're going to be talking about digital preservation. If you've read the abstract for this section, you know I got a little bit fruity with, with the verbiage. If you haven't, you'll get that joke later. But anyway. <laughs> um, I have been rereading a fantastic book that I'd highly recommend to everybody called Burning the Books, A History of Knowledge Under Attack, which was written by Richard Ovenden, the Bodley's librarian at the University of Oxford. And in it, he documents the destruction of major world research centers of learning, major libraries, through history and time. And um, library collections tend to uh, be destroyed and lost due to fire. Think of the great Library of Alexandria in Egypt. They are destroyed during times of social upheaval. The Reformation, for example, um, King Henry VIII sacking all of the abbeys in this country, and with it, a huge swath of destruction of all of those um, monastic libraries. Um, the attempted Nazi eradic eradication of Jewish culture and history during World War II. War is also a major destructive force for knowledge. The British sacking of Washington, D.C. in the Library of Congress, not once, but twice, I didn't know that, documented in here, and Russian aggression in the Ukraine at the moment, resulting in the eradication of knowledge. So today we're going to talk about digital preservation. We have distinguished panelists. And so an opening question for the three of you, should researchers feel confident that their contributions to scholarship are safe for the long term? Do you want me to start? Please do. All right. So my guess is that they feel confident, but that that's because they don't really know what is and isn't being done. And there are certainly some collections that are uh, being well-preserved and others that are not. And they're relatively oblivious. They're taking it for granted. Miguel, is it different in Brazil for you? Uh, I guess it's, it's not most the same. Um, I think a digital academic content is at risk of disappearing for future researchers and students. Uh, they are likely to lose access to a large portion of academic records. Uh, but there is a real need. There is a real need for more librarians and publishers to develop and implement digital preservation plans and policies. Um, but what I can say that <laughs> the uh, publishers can be um, confident if they deposit the inform in information systems of libraries and archives of institutions that have policies, plans, distribution of digital preservation evaluated. And Stephen, in Ca Canada, you guys are civilized, you get on with everybody, you have no enemies anywhere in the world. Should Canadian scholars be reassured that all of their scholarship I, is preserved? Uh, no, I, not, in, in no way should they, should they feel confident of that. I think for reasons that have been raised already, I think, uh, you know, Judy raises a good, question around, a, a good question around sort of coverage, and Miguel touched on that as well. I think that is a big one. Uh, you know, how many things actually are even in a state that we would consider collected, much less preserved. Um, but I think there's a separate question there around the extent of those activities and not, you know, let's assume that we have some percentage of things actually collected in a place that we might think of as reasonably stable. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be preserved for the long term. And, uh, you know, for reasons that I suspect we'll get into as this conversation moves forward, uh, Digital preservation is an ongoing process, right? It's not a simple box tick that happens at some point when something is deposited. It requires a lot of ongoing effort and expenditure of both human and many times financial resources because there are computational needs to it as well. And without a solid understanding, not just of what it is we're trying to preserve and how much we have of that, but actually what we're signing it up for in terms of process, I, I don't think any of us can be confident that that the material that we care about or that we're generating is going to be well preserved. Excellent. So complacency. If anyone walked into this room thinking that the job of preserving journals and books that scholars have contributed to and created or the knowledge contained within is a done deal, please be disabused of that. That is not the case. 
Now, Stephen refers to even if we could tell what percentage of, of knowledge is preserved. I, I was struck, I saw um, a presentation at the Charleston Conference by Michelle Palcho, who is um, a librarian at UC Davis, the University of California, Davis. And she's done some research mapping their journal collection at UC Davis to publicly discoverable archival holdings. And her conclusion was that they can only feel really confident that 40% of their journals are digitally preserved for the future, which I found staggeringly low. Uh, I did how, as well. How many things are number. preserved? Well, and I think we don't know. So I'm at a university. We try to put preservation requirements in all of our licenses because we are worried about that. And we know that with the print books, we've had physical control. And we can be responsible, and we're in a lot of shared print uh, services. But with the digital, we're really relying primarily then on the publishers. And so we try to include that in our licenses. But there's not a lot of teeth in those in terms of exactly what the level of quality of that preservation is or um, how thoroughly it's being done. Um, I know when you and I had a conversation a year or so ago, I was surprised to learn that many of the journal publishers are very good about preserving their journals, but not their e-books. And that was quite a surprise to me because I assumed that, of course, they were doing that. Right? That's their capital, really, for the future. Uh, but I'm, I'm afraid we don't know very much but we would like to know more. So I think we're looking at how the licensing might change to actually ask for some reporting back or some central place where it was documented what was available so we could confirm what was, what was actually preserved rather than maybe, as he said, just backed up somewhere. Right. And my understanding is that Crossref is doing some work now to um, automate uh, the checking of publisher assertions about what is preserved, which could be a really handy tool. This is a, uh, a need I hear expressed by a lot of librarians, that they'd like to just check that the content that they've licensed or purchased from publishers is safe and, and, and in a professional environment. Stephen, in Canada, uh, is all Canadian content preserved? Is there any way to do that? No, I mean we're you know we're in the same sort of don't know what we don't know uh, situation that that Judy was was implying there as well, and uh, you know I, there are efforts underway, uh, you know particularly Canadian national efforts to collect and preserve Canadian content, obviously because we're the ones best suited to understand where that's coming from and to to actually preserve it, but it. You know, it, it becomes a dynamic very similar to to what was shown in the Palcho paper and, and, and what I think Florida and, and my colleagues in Brazil would see as well, which is that certain collections tend to be very well represented in preservation repositories and then other things not at all. Right. And so it's it's, you know, and oftentimes that's small press or independent or, you know, smaller society journals uh, that just don't because they don't have those inroads to relationships with publishers who have established pathways to us acting as preservation service providers, maybe they don't even think of it. And I, I, so I, I see that as something that needs to change. I think there's some awareness building that has to go on there. But no, I mean, it doesn't, you know, I, I, while I can't concretely discuss the extent to which I think things are not being preserved, I do feel very confident to sit here and say, no, we're leaving a lot of stuff on the table in terms of its prospects for the long term. That's great. So there might be some opportunities, too, for partnership between libraries and publishers to make it easier to discover the preservation status of the scholarship that we are collectively interested uh, to disseminate and to make available. M Miguel, I, that, can you tell us a little bit about your, your archive in Brazil, Cariniana? How do, does it capture all Brazilian content? Not really, but uh, what I claim to say that the preservation acquires different meaning depending on the context in which it takes place. 
So in Brazil, uh, we are starting with the, uh, the, the journals, the scientific journals. And we have been very lucky because we are, um, we are now part of the log community. And it's a system that allows us to, to have the chance to learn about digital preservation. So in Brazil, the initiative of preservation um, is, is, is trying to consider the long time in preservation. Um, uh, what concerns about the scientific journals, we are okay. We have all our journals preserved. Mm -hmm. Great, okay. So we've already heard that the works of smaller publishers might be um, vulnerable. This is a potential gap in the, in the digital preservation record. Um, open access content has also come into focus in the last few years um, with Michael Laxo doing some, I think, really solid research to identify gaps with disappearing open access journals and books as well. Where are the other likely gaps? What is the kind of content that we should be most focused on and worried about? Stephen, do you have a view? Um, I think that emerging areas of concern for us are definitely around data sets, so research data sets, um, whether those are things that are being directly used to support publications that are part of journals or books or, or any other sort of publishing that, that we're, are also in the repositories. I think those, those uh, data sets are a concern. Um, I think we're also very concerned around um, and, and maybe this is less of interest to this group, although I think we all benefit from a greater uh, access to it, is kind of gray literature type of uh, materials. So uh, unpublished reports that are nonetheless end up being influential, right? These can be policy reports that are put out by the government uh, or by think tanks or whoever. Um, I think those are generally not well represented either, but, but I guess to, for, for something I would want to talk about, in front of this crowd, I would definitely say the data sets piece, research data, uh, you know, either in support of findings or in support of new scholarship is something that we're really grappling with now. That's really helpful. And it, it, it's about preserving the data sets and publications and other related materials, software code, video we've been hearing about today, but also, also the interrelationships of them, how they connect together and ensuring that all of those parts um, are preserved and remain usable over time. Fantastic. Absolutely. I mean, it, you know, there, there's a lot of hay that gets made about replication studies and sort of our ability to look at historical journal articles or historical pieces of research and to be able to reproduce them or not. Um, data is a huge part of that, but it's also a building block for future research too, right? I mean, we look at, uh, there are certain types of data and many of them are go on to inform research that's that's captured in publications that that we all in this room care about some of that data can't be gathered again right whether it's atmospheric or astronomic or you know things like that it's it's you know fixed in time and if it wasn't gathered at that time it it can't be gathered again and and it becomes very important moving forward for that reason Do you, oh, go on. Hello. i would very much agree with what he said and we spend a lot of time worrying about the research data I think he also mentioned what we call the gray literature, the unpublished literature, the conference papers. We just heard that these recordings are going to be made available. I hope not to embarrass Mark too much by asking, is there a preservation set of the historic R2R um, content? And if so, where and how would that be accessed? Maybe currently uh, there's a source, but is there a guarantee of any kind of long-term access? And I think we see that a lot with those types of things where there's white papers and other kinds of documents and conference reports and those sorts of things that it's so reliant on the individual institution of what decision they make. And I know we've historically seen things where, oh, well, when the New Year's new conference comes out next year, we just overwrite you know, what was on there last year. And it's like, no, don't do that. But, um, but I think there are a lot of gaps and we tend to focus a lot on the published literature, the journals and the e-books, and not so much on the unpublished. Right, so the unpublished materials and the supplementary materials right. around the formal publications, that's really helpful. A very right. modest person who's in the audience, who I won't embarrass by, by mentioning, said, said to me, oh, when I was a researcher, um, you know, my contribution was modest to the scholarly record. Nobody will want to read that in the future. And I just think that you know we um, can't predict 
with any kind of reliability what future researchers will take an interest in. Um, the, all of the, the avenues of research around the COVID vaccination, successful and unsuccessful, will reveal some powerful things about 2020 and 2021 to future historians. And so there is a need to be not comprehensive, we can't preserve everything, but perhaps a little bit more broadly than we're doing at present. Um, Judy, I had a special question for you. Uh -oh. So as a, a library <laughs> dean, libraries, you've already said, um, spend a lot of time and effort preserving printed collections and you collaborate to do this as well across organizational boundaries. How do you think about the print preservation and the digital preservation? How do these fit together? Well, increasingly, our print collections stopped short at a point. There was a period there where, there, where we kept both, you know, we, we continued to get print, but now most of the publishers don't even offer that anymore in many cases. And so we, we don't have anything that we can manage and control. So we um, then do have to fully rely on what decisions they make or convey to us what reassurances they can provide to us about what they're doing because it's no longer in our hands. But there's certainly enormous value um, in the digital copies, even of the things where we have print because of the searchability. It would still be very difficult to do a lot of the retrospective research we could do it, we used to do it in the good old days, but to go back and try to do that with the print collections. So the digital collections are incredibly important, even on the things where we have print. Thank you for that. Now we're gonna come back to this issue of use, whether to preserve content or usability, but I'm told by our um, wonderful supervisor, Arend, that Rick Anderson has a question. So could you come up to the microphone, Rick? And could I really encourage you, if you're online, if you're in the room, feel free to put your question in a chat. And um, it, it beams up here magically. So, Rick, over to you. So uh, this is a question that I posed in the chat. And at the same time that I was typing it, Robert Kiley, who's attending remotely, was typing essentially the same question. So uh, our question is, um, it, it seems like the, the conversation around digital preservation is very often seems to be founded on the assumption that everything must be preserved and therefore everything should be preserved. But even if we just limit ourselves to scholarly content, it's clear that not everything can be preserved. And um, Alicia, your, your comment that you know, we have no way of knowing in the future what people will and won't be interested in, that, that argument is often evoked when the question is asked, well, what, what should we not preserve? The problem is that since we can't know what people will be interested in in the future, and we can't preserve everything, how should we prioritize our, uh, our, our resource allocations? Brilliant question, and I was hoping somebody would bring this up. So part of the reason digital preservation is different than backing up your content and having lots of secure copies is that preservation requires active curation. Stephen's already talked about the active management of the content, but there is also curation in the sense of what is collected and what is looked after, what is um, a weeded from collections. We've been hearing about this from Judy. And also with digital content, curation decisions are taken about when to migrate formats. It's a very active and specialist um, area of content management. Um, so for clocks, just speaking for the organization that I represent, we are tasked with collecting any content that is collected by research libraries anywhere in the world because they have already made decisions locally that that content is relevant for scholars in their organizations and for the future. That's quite a broad collecting area and um, I'm sure we haven't hit the 40% mark of that, of that um, collection target. Miguel, what would, what would you say to this? Can we collect everything? Should we? Well, what I think is that the digital preservation activities must observe in the way they are conceived and in the performance of this material. So really, we don't know what's going to happen in the future, but we need the specific profiles for professionals that deal with this material and can um, understand what is the option that we, the organization need to adopt. 
because um, uh, in a long term preservation, it's like uh, um, Stephen said, it's something constant. It's nothing that is just uh, a one time. So um, what I think is, is, is the way we need to, to, to deal with uh, digital objects because digital objects doesn't have meaning. They meaning, they need meaning uh, they, for, to uh, and interpret them, you know? I don't know if I <laughs> made me clear. Thank you, Miguel. Stephen, can I come back to you with that question of are we preserving content or usability? What do you think? Uh, for sure. Um, I, I think it depends. And I, I was sort of waiting to jump in after Miguel, and I was going to say it depends. I'll just say depend, it depends here, because that's my answer for a lot of this, right? Is, it, you know, are we capturing what is important to us? It depends. Um, are we capturing content? Or are we capturing functionality? It depends. What does it depend on? And I think this ties into the question that was asked. It depends on what the needs of our users are, right? And, and in the absence of understanding those needs specifically, we, we do find ourselves wedded to this very broad kind of generalist approach to preservation where it almost becomes reasonable to think, oh man, yeah, we do have to get it all, right? We do have to get it all and we have to make sure that it's all preserved well. We know that that's not feasible, so we, we need some way to slice and dice that. And I think there are, there are two signposts that we can look at there, whether we're talking about the question of what we should be collecting or like what we should be collecting now um, versus later, or whether we should be doing content or functionality. Uh, the first is the needs of this group that we in, in preservation like to call our designated community, right? And, and it's a whole thing, I won't go into it here, but basically the idea is the, this is the community, and the people, the jobs, the roles for whom we are preserving things. And it's important because they're the ones who can tell us what it is they need and how it is they need it. Whether it is the fact that they just need the words that are on the page or whether they, there is advanced functionality uh, as there are in many of these scholarship platforms that enable search or concordance or any kind of functionality like that, uh, you know, they're the ones who can tell us is that important. And, you know, I don't, we, what we do at the University of Toronto, you know, both internally in the library, but also in partnerships uh, with other preservation service providers or with our colleagues across the country or internationally is the, you know, we we have to look at that. And some of the things we preserve on a content basis and some of the things we have to preserve on a functionality basis. Uh, what I will say is, for the most part, the things that we're looking at on a functionality basis, that process is much more labor intensive than one that would be based on the content. Because, uh, well, I, we can get into it if you want. I won't do it here because I, we have limited time, but that's a consideration too, right? So. What if, for whom are we preserving this thing? What kind of access do we have to the object to be preserved, right? Because for content, that can be relatively straightforward. We have articles, we can, we can find various ways of extracting text from those artifacts if we need to, but it's much more complicated for a software artifact, like a website or a platform or something like that. You know, even if we're just thinking about a basic sort of standalone website that has access to content, never mind if there are connections then between that content and other pieces of content or the internet or user interaction or anything like that, right? The more wrinkles we have around the artifact that we're trying to preserve, it becomes, you know, I'll, I'll, say, I'll say exponentially, don't hold me to it because I'm not sure actually math it out, but it becomes way more difficult to preserve the functionality. So I think we have to be choosy about when we, when we choose to preserve functionality, but that we shouldn't shy away from doing that when it's important. And the only way that we know that it's important is when our communities are telling us that it is. Thank you for that, Stephen. Miguel, you're next, but can I also invite Ellie Key to make her way to the microphone? I hope I've got your pronouns right. I apologize if I don't, but Miguel, do you want to make your intervention? First? Uh, yes, I, want to, I just want to uh, um, add something about what Mark was saying is that uh, what is important for the digital environment is that the, the functionality is most, um, it, de it depends on the object. 
depend on the many, many factors, it's necessary to ensure something very important, that the contents remains the same in any different way that it is pressed. So uh, that we, that's the work that librarians and arch archivists need to do, to be sure that all the contents is not going to change around, uh, on the time that is going to be useful. Mm -hmm. I, I'm really struggling yeah. with. Steven, let's, uh, whoa. <laughs> let's let Ellie have her go. We can talk to each other all the time, but Ellie. <laughs> Hi. Um, I was wondering if the panel could address the challenge of sustainability when it comes to digital preservation and the balance between needing to preserve content and also the environmental implications of that. Ultimately, we have limited resources. It used to be space. Uh, and now it's digital space, but also um, uh, resources around the world. So how do we come to that balance? So I, I would be keen to answer that. Stephen, is this an area of, of expertise for you too? Okay. No, so, please um, go ahead. I think this is, well, I know, this is a widespread discussion in the digital preservation community, but we are taking the first baby steps in order to figure out what our carbon footprint is, what the implications are from an environmental sustainability perspective. And here I'd really like to celebrate the contributions of publishers, some of whom are in the room. Um, I'll particularly do a shout out for Cambridge University Press and IOPP, both of which have approached um, me at Clock's Archive. Um, they've shared with us methodologies that we can use to begin to establish our carbon footprint. And I've really appreciated that. We are a not-for-profit with 10 members of staff, and we want to climb this learning curve. We want to be good citizens, but we need your help. And this is where having a collaborative community of librarians and publishers who can share information on such an important topic we can all help each other learn as we go forward. Stephen, do you have a perspective, or, or Miguel, or Judy? No, I think that's a very good point, though, that we're increasingly sensitive about this, and the idea of these massive server farms that we might be needing for trying to keep everything, um, and what what the probability of the sustainability of that is. That's it, so probability is a great word. Um, I'm not a naturally quantitative person, but in a lot of the risk assessments about how many copies you need and where they need to be distributed, we are calculating risk and trying to manage it very actively. So with clocks, we have 12 copies which are uh, spread around the world in highly secure offline environments. They're not in the cloud at all. Um, which uh, to us is the right kind of risk assessment of the footprint we need to keep the content we are entrusted to safe. If we knew that that content was also in two other preservation services, we might be able to do that calculus differently. Maybe we would only need six copies or five copies. But it does need to be present and properly curated in professional long-term archives. Um, for us to change that risk assessment. And that's one of the reasons that in some of the model licensing language that we've been working on, that we are recommending that there not be a single preservation site for some specific content, but that it be in two or preferably three because of distributing the risk, but also reducing the necessity for one to try to have an even greater concern about that risk and therefore maybe excessive redundancy. Exactly right. Do you want to say anything else about that licensing language, how it's come about when publishers and libraries will see it? I'm not so sure about the release date part. I'll let you speak to that. But there has been a group of us that have been working for some time um, on, on the idea that it does always help to have model language that uh, is easier, I think, for the publishers when we come forward with something that's consistent from one institution to another, because it's problematic for them if I want something and you want something else, and Stephen wants something different, and you know they're trying to uh, rationalize that. But I think it's also just to, to have a common starting point, and and I think to begin to make it really clear 
to some of the publishers who have not really seen this as a necessity, how important it really is to us as their clients and how much we feel the need for uh, the partnership with them because we have turned over to them the responsibility where it used to be a responsibility that we carried ourselves and, and then we were making our own assessments and our own investments. Um, so I don't know if that gets that conversation started. But. Yeah, and uh, Stephen, you've been on that working group as well. Um, why has that been a useful uh, way to spend your time over the last year or so? Well, I mean, it, it really is about, you know, the, I guess, a, a, as, as Judy said, sort of a, a model license isn't anything that anyone is obligated to accept or use or anything else, right? What it is, is a starting point for conversation. And sometimes it's a useful starting and ending point, if everything is great, uh, as we think this license actually is quite nice in terms of balance of rights and responsibilities and things, but it, but if nothing else, it gets the conversation started. And uh, I, that's why it's been useful for me is just to, to keep that in mind, right? That, that, you know, we, we are different stakeholders coming to a table to have a conversation about who has the rights to do what with content. But the reason we're having that conversation is because we all value the content. You know, like it means different things to all of us, but it means something to all of us too. I think we've also been working to try to distinguish between what I would say is true or pure preservation of the content and the residual rights you might have after termination of a license, because those things tend to get commingled in license language and they're really quite distinct in terms of the responsibilities. And so again, we thought that if we created that clarity in the model language, it would help both parties to, to be sure that they're dealing both re with residual rights, if any, that fall out of the contractual relationship, and then the preservation of that content, which we really see as being a, a separate but parallel issue. Absolutely. And um, I hadn't uh, appreciated that we would go here, but it might be interesting for the, for the um, people in the in the uh, conference, um, it, there's an incredibly important um, copyright issue that underpins digital preservation. The, the way an archive or a library um, is able to obtain access to the content can really um, change uh, what is possible to preserve and how the preservation happens. So clocks, portico, similar organizations that approach this in partnership with publishers, negotiating access to the content, being guided by librarians about what's wanted and needed, th this is a much more powerful starting point for digital preservation. Um, we're not digitizing content. Um, we're not uh, taking PDFs under legal deposit legislation. We're starting often from XML, from very rich interactive versions of the material, which gets us all further forward faster. And very important for the preservation because the outputs in the future may be quite different and XML presumably provides the flexibility for that where some of the current file formats might not. That's right, and this gets us back to one of Stephen's points about uh, usability and interactivity. Um, EPUB 3 is one of, is considered to be one of the most preservable um, uh, book formats. It's also one of the most accessible book formats if you are supporting people uh, with print disabilities, for example, uh, people who are blind or with um, dyslexia. And it's also very usable uh, for the full range of users. So there's a standards development piece here too. And Stephen, I think this is, perhaps an area of expertise for you. Which, which formats should we be looking to if we want our content to be preserved for the long term? Uh, that's, that's a great question. Yeah, I think EPUB 3 is, is a useful one. I think, inter, you know, and that largely applies to uh, books. I mean, it can, you, it can apply to any, any type of printed material, of course, but we tend to see that more in the like, electronic book space. Uh, in terms of journal articles, uh, we, we make a uh, pretty heavy reliance of the uh, NLM uh, XML format, um, the, the National Library of Medicine 
uh, has a nice um, uh, format that's used for encoding scholarly journal articles, and we make heavy use of that. But, but at the end of the day, I mean, anything that is well-structured and consistent in the way that it's delivered, especially if it's XML or plain text or something like that, we can work with. Because again, as long as it's well-formed and valid and predictable, things can be crosswalked, right? Uh, you know, and they can be transformed in, in cooperation with the publisher or, uh, you know, even in, in dire circumstances if we have to do it, right? So, so, so the goal there, I, I guess why I bring that up is, you know, always bringing it back to this idea of sort of the relationship that we're trying to set up between us as memory institutions and the publisher is it doesn't have to be a big pain in the butt, right? It, you know, if we're not saying like, hey, for preservation, please generate this whole other set of derivatives for us, maybe we can do that, you know, as long as we know, as long as there are standards and that the specification is available to us, we can maybe work with that. But if there are standards in place that work for you, like EPUB 3, and if you're generating those for reasons already that maybe are accessibility or maybe, uh, you know, because that's what works inside your internal content management system, let's, let's roll with that. Excellent, thank you. Um, well, I'll just say that again, because I'm really taken, I was taken by it. Um, content, that is accessible and usable is more likely to be preservable. So there's a lovely, lovely win-win-win uh, to be had there. Um, I'm told that Heather, do you, Heather Staines from Delta Think, do you have a comment or question? Hello. Well, I was gonna plug the, the NASIG model uh, preservation license that the committee that Alicia and I uh, serve on together so, I mean, if anyone wants to find out more about that later, you can check with us. But I think we're on to kind of another topic now. So I wanted to ask, this morning, uh, Peter Berkery talked about some of the really innovative digital humanities projects that are coming out um, of university presses. Brown University has some great ones. There's, there's incredible stuff on Fulcrum and Manifold and, and, and PubPub. And that type of cutting edge content is, very challenging um, to preserve. And I, I think I was having a conversation with Morris York, who's now at Big Ten Academic Alliance, but was previously at Michigan, and he was like, to preserve it, you must destroy it, uh, which was very depressing to hear. But um, I understood making snapshots, um, you know, destroyed the essence of the, the thing that you thought was so great. Can you talk a little bit, or you know, any of you, about what are the conversations now that we're in the era of preserving you know, video games and, you know, interactive websites and things like that. Yeah, I think we can. Um, I would say that this is a fruitful area where there's quite a lot of research and development happening right now. Um, we, we are participating in two Mellon-funded grants um, to look at very um, interactive and highly complex types of scholarly outputs about how they can be preserved. Um, I, ISO, uh, the standards organization is just setting and train a three-year process to codify the preservation approach for interactive EPUB files. Um, so there is a lot of R&D. Stephen, I know this is an area of expertise for you as well. What would you say? What are we doing about highly um, creative scholarship? Uh, the best we can. Um, and, it, you know, the point is well taken from, from, from the question asker that, like, it, it's you know, it's a grim prospect to preserve some of the stuff we have to destroy it, right? I mean, ask an archeologist how they feel about it because it's the same kind of thing in that field, right? We, we have to, you know, to an, ex to an extent, um, we can approach these things from like a short-term, long-term perspective. So we can say in the short-term, maybe it's reasonable for us to keep a site running in the way that it's running now uh, through you know, maintaining a server environment that, that serves it up. And, and in some ways, that's actually become easier over time due to the way that we use virtualization around uh, the creation of these projects. But ultimately, that environment in which it was set up to run is going to fail, right? It's going to become obsolete. And we're not going to be able to use it anymore. So that's the point where we really do need to start thinking about what's next for the project. And, and that's where we have to have a really sober look, you know, here, here's another depressing element to it. We, we have to have a really sober look at whether this thing that was cutting edge when it came out still is, 
and whether it's still significant in the way that it was when it came out or whether or not it served as an important stepping stone for, for where the conversation went, but ultimately has been superseded. And, you know, that comes back to that uh, community monitoring. It comes back to a fulsome partnership between people who can tell us how the thing is being used, like under what circumstances it was produced and why, and how it's being used, whether that's changed over time, and people who are on the hook for preserving it, whether that means maintaining an old environment, whether that means creating a new one, whether that means re redeveloping the whole process or breaking it down to its key elements and thinking about a different kind of existence for it. Um, again, there are, you know, there are a lot of perspectives that are necessary in order to make that conversation a fulsome one. And uh, you know, many of them are in this room, many of them are the researchers. And thank you for that, Stephen. And uh, some of the most interesting thought leadership in this space is, I think, going on in the library publishing world, um, which is driving forward really creative new forms of scholarship and thinking about how to make those scalable and sustainable. So colleagues at the University of Michigan, NYU, the Leibniz Institutes in Germany, there are some really creative people applying themselves to these sorts of questions and issues. It's not a solved problem. Um, and some of that knowledge might be quite useful coming back into the, the more established publishing world as well. That would be my suggestion. Well, I think we're almost out of time. Is there one takeaway that you'd like to add, anyone? I think just that increasing everybody's awareness and sensitivity about this is incredibly important. It is something that does need to be collaborative. It does need to be a factor in uh, the design of the publications and the content. And it does need to be uh, addressed appropriately from both the perspective of the licensee and the licensor as we go into dealing with that content. And open access content as well, or is oh, it only licensed content? No. I think in some ways I worry that there's more risk with the open access content because there isn't that structure behind it, you know, of the publisher, either whether that's a long-term society publisher or whether that's a commercial publisher that's invested in that. And so I think we do all have to um, really look at that very carefully too and make sure that I, I feel there may just be more risk that some of the organizations that are starting open access publishing may not be there to sustain it and so the rest of us are going to need to be sure it ends up in a good place if those publishers don't go forward. Thank you for that Judy. Miguel any last thoughts or key takeaway? Well, there is a lot of things that made me talk and think about. Um, but what I think is the because we are talking with uh, publishers that the the answer of reading your to, the, to preserve your contents is to read the risk risk reports of the project of preservation of your material. I mean, uh, you need to understand the strategic preservation plans that the um, the the the, uh, the great uh, um, publishers, or I mean, the the sell, sell, sellers, 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 and and people who give you uh, choices for preservation. I mean, you need to read new uh, your terms of use in these contracts, in this agreement, because they need to consider the environment also. Um, there are some good experience in archivists in America who are trying to to deal with this uh, uh, compromising with the environment. So I think we need to start talking about, like Mark says, uh, partnerships and um, all around the world, we are guests, we are on the same boat. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you so much. And Stephen, thank you too. But um, Arend is here with a big hook and he's going to pull us off the stage now. <laughs> yes, so, if any, um, thank you. Thank yeah, you. Go ahead. Thank and you. thank you all. Thank you very much for the session, first of all.